Welcome back to Face the Nation. Joining us now, in addition to Jeffrey Goldberg, we have Ruth Marcus, who's a columnist and now deputy editorial page editor of The Washington Post. Congratulations, Ruth, on your new role. Mark Leibovich is the chief national correspondent for The New York Times Magazine. Peggy Noonan is a columnist for The Wall Street Journal and a CBS News contributor. And Ron Brownstein is senior editor at The Atlantic. Okay, Ruth, I'm starting with you. Ooh. This was, uh, we're going to start with emails, a, b- a very <laughs> tough Inspector General report coming out of the State Department for Hillary Clinton. She went around the rules when her staffers were asked about her private server system. They were told, do not ask about it again. What did you make of her and her campaign's response to that report? Uh, less than helpful mm. to her and her campaign. The campaign would like this report to be understood as old news, yesterday's news, nothing new here, let's move along. It is less than devastating, but it is um, also less than helpful. It's both a reminder to people of the doubts, the pre-existing doubts that they already have about Hillary Clinton. She's not trustworthy. She doesn't think that the regular rules apply to her. Um, And it adds some new information along those lines about the degree to which she never checked with anybody about um, what this was and about if she had bothered to check, she would have been told no, this report says. That's what's the most troubling, I thought, in this report. I mean, kind of the insularity and the arrogance, not so much the specifics of the emails, but about the kind of leadership style and, and what it says about how you might be as president. I did a panel a couple of years ago when Jim Baker and George Mitchell were winning the Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Academy of Public Administration, and they each said the same thing. The, the toughest thing was to find someone who could tell a president they were wrong. And what was, what, was, what was, I thought, most apparent in this report was that there was no one around her who was willing to tell her that she was wrong. And when people yeah. tried to raise questions, they were told to be quiet. That, that is a, those are ominous traits for a president. Yeah. Uh, Secretary Bob Gates said the exact same thing recently in an interview <clears throat> with him that we did. And then we asked Hillary Clinton about, didn't somebody tell you that this was wrong? And she said, well, no, because it was allowed. This report obviously Mm. said it wasn't allowed. No, it wasn't business as usual. It was not approved. And when two professionals in state went to Hillary's people and did say, you know, we're concerned about this hacking, Uh, this isn't as it should be, they were literally told, don't come to us Mm. and say this again. That is terrible for a future president. There's one good thing, inspector generals or inspectors general in Washington, D.C., consistently do good work. Nobody had gotten it at all near the bottom of this story. I think State's IG did a good job. I think, so, well, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I would just say that, 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 that Donald Trump, instead of, yeah. I mean, I think this was a great week for Donald Trump to not say anything. And of course, yeah. so much oxygen <laughs> yeah. was taken by Donald Trump bringing up Vince Foster and what he said about the Mexican judge in in San Diego the other day. I mean, this is a lot of oxygen being devoted to an issue that, you know, frankly, could have been spent talking about Hillary Clinton. Well, we'll we'll, uh, get to Donald Trump and some of the exciting things that he said. But, Jeffrey, let me ask you about this. We've been talking about the past and what this report says about the way Hillary Clinton behaved in the past. But I was talking to Democrats who have her interests so much at heart. Mm -hmm. They are on her team. And they are pulling their hair out at how badly the, the, this was handled in, re, in response to this. That, that when, when the email uh, story first came out, somebody from her campaign said, well, she had behaved in the spirit and letter of the law. That is both not true. But in this week in response to this, the, 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 the people I've talked to have been shocked at how poorly it's been handled. Uh, yeah, I mean, the whole Democratic establishment, to borrow a term from Bernie Sanders, the whole Democratic establishment is sort of feels like it's on a Batan death march mm-hmm. uh, to the nomination, o- obviously because of Bernie, because of a, a lot of other things. But but this has just made them made them think to themselves that they don't have this in hand. They don't, and, and the issue, I, I was talking to someone this week who said that the issue is that they don't understand how they're perceived. To go back to this point that Ron and Peggy were making, they, they don't understand how it's being interpreted. Nobody inside is telling them, guys, she has a credibility problem. She has an honesty problem. You have to grab this by the horns or else this summer is going to be a very, very long and possibly, to use your word, devastating summer for her. Uh, so, so there's still a kind of di- a discord or, di- uh, or, or, or dissonance between what the establishment is thinking about this handling and, and the way they're doing it. Well, Hillary Clinton doesn't help herself when she argues at when the email story first came out and after this IG report, 
that she has done nothing, A, she has done nothing different than any other previous Secretary of yeah. State, you know, stretching back apparently to Thomas Jefferson. Right. Um, he had terrible email yeah. priorities. Yeah. 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 Which, got which is actually just not accurate. And B, that um, she has been as even more forthcoming than anybody else because, look, she voluntarily gave over these things. That's just not accurate and it's not convincing. And she How, didn't talk yeah. to this Inspector General. Yeah. And she didn't, she didn't talk to this Inspector General, which leads me to my next point, which is this is a tremor compared to the earthquake mm -hmm. that I don't think is coming, but that could come in terms of the... FBI Justice Department investigation into not the you know the handling of the emails but whether there was misuse of classified right. information. Well, let me ask you we talked to Bernie Sanders and he said well this is of yeah. course something that superdelegates will be thinking about if they're thinking about it at all assess for us whether you think Bernie Sanders's approach here which is basically to try and convince these superdelegates whether he has a chance in making that case and using this new information and the FBI investigation Ruth talked about in his case. Well, I think there's there's something of, of an illusion at, at this point in the Democratic race. And if you look toward the general election polling, where Hillary Clinton is in the arena, is in the crosshairs, uh, and uh, many and her weaknesses are all out there uh, for the public. I think Sanders polling better, which is the core of his argument to the superdelegates, I poll better, that is really an untested proposition. Because I don't think, uh, no one has really spent any money yet publicizing the vulnerabilities that Bernie Sanders would bring to a general election. In particular, by their own count, by, by, by you know objective estimates, his agenda would increase federal spending by $1.6 trillion, 40% overnight to the highest level as a share of the GDP since World War II, with taxes commensurate to do that. You know, after a billion dollars is spent on television, Ohio and Florida and the suburbs of Denver telling people that his general election numbers might look a lot different than they do now. Not, not to say that he would necessarily be less competitive than Hillary Clinton, uh, although I think in the end he would be, but certainly he'd be less competitive than it appears now. And the fact is, I think superdelegates, superdelegates are doing what they were designed to do. They were created precisely after the McGovern and Carter experiences because the part party wanted more of a handle on f uh, producing a nominee that they thought could win and could govern. And the fact is that at least the leadership of the Democratic Party don't think that Sanders passes either of those tests as much as Clinton. Peggy, what do you think? The Bernie Sanders sticking around hurts Hillary Clinton how much when Donald Trump is out there as the Republican nominee for Democrats to rally around? Well, it, I guess it hurts Mrs. Clinton's uh, standing or the perception of her that she is Hillary Clinton, this behemoth with this organization, mm. with this money, with everything, and she can't put this guy away. That is a challenge to her. That, that tells everybody vulnerability, vulnerability. But I still think the big story that we're talking about here in the email thing is very, very simple. Americans don't really trust Mrs. Clinton uh, to be forthcoming and truthful. That's all in the polls. I forget what mm. words they are, but you know what I mean. When you look at the tape of Mrs. Clinton saying things about the emails that have been shown to not have been true in the IG thing, she has been, I hate to say lie, but she has lied coolly in a, in a creamy, practiced way. It doesn't look good. I would just, go ahead. Go I know, ahead. I would just add to that, that, that in the hierarchy of, of worries, I, I would definitely put Bernie Sanders as, as, as lower down than the FBI. I think it's, yeah. I think Ruth is right, is a slim chance that this becomes a huge legal problem, but, but it's, it's, it's looming out it's there. It's already so, a huge political yeah. problem. Yeah. It's a huge yeah. political problem, but legal yeah. problems are another thing entirely. But yeah. Take, bouncing off of Peggy's point, Mark, uh, what the Clinton people would say and Democrats would say is, wait a minute, this campaign is not happening in a vacuum. The challenge here yeah. with the IG report is it's Hillary Clinton versus the inspector general. Sure. They would like it to be Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump. Sure. Donald Trump also has very high negative numbers in terms of honesty and trustworthiness. Yes, I, I would say two things about that. I mean, I think Peggy's point that it was not business as usual compared to past secretaries of state is apt, but I think voters see this as business of usual, as usual in the Clinton world. This is a classic it's Clinton true. MO, it's the true. arc of revelations sort of dissembling, um, you know, spinning in a very professional way, um, you know, really not convincing anyone. It confirms everything we've been talking about Hillary Clinton. On the other hand, I, I think, look, I mean, the Clinton people would say, I think with some justification, that there's a complete double standard in honesty between Hillary Clinton mm -hmm. and Donald Trump. I mean, I think if you were to look week to week at what Donald Trump says and what Hillary Clinton says or doesn't say, and part of this is right. just the visibility he, he takes on, um, it's not even close. I mean, Donald Trump, just the volume of stuff that comes out of his mouth. The and volume of right. things yeah. that well, comes and, out and of his even mouth. With, and even with Sanders, right? I mean, even with your interview with, 
with, with Senator Sanders. I mean, the fact is, he has run an incredible race, but he's lost the race, and not in the back room. He's lost it at the ballot. She's won three million more votes than he has. She's won 55 percent of the total vote. If you look at all the primaries and all the caucuses, of the 20 biggest states that have voted, of the 20 biggest states, 18 have already voted. She's won 14 of them. 12 of the 20 states he's won have been among the smallest. You look at the exit polls, they've split white voters. She's dominated three quarters of African Americans, three fifths of Latinos. I mean, he has run a great race, but she has beaten him. And, and, you know, that is the reality that Democrats are facing here at the finish line. Let's pause here. We'll talk about the Republicans when we get back. So stick with us and we'll have more from our panel. And we're back with our panel. Ruth, let's talk about the Republicans a little bit. Donald Trump and Paul Ryan have still yet to have their final moment of unity. But Republicans, we saw with Senator Johnson, uh, he's now he's on board with the Trump train. They seem to have really come behind Donald Trump. All that talk we had about disunity, the polls and otherwise seem to suggest people are on board. Um, people are on board and the ones that aren't on board are getting on board. We talked about this a few weeks ago when I suggested I was a little worried that I might be wrong that uh, before the Ryan um, Trump meeting that it might be the moment of peak anti-Trumpism. <laughs> Turns out I was right. Um, everyone is getting on board. There's kind of Mitt Romney and a merry band of um, hand wringing, and I mean that in the best possible way. <laughs> columnists, some of them, some of them work for me. And one Nebraska uh, senator, and, yeah. um, yeah. and one Nebraska senator who are kind of the, the remaining holdouts, uh, and both uh, significantly both voters, Republican voters, and Republican elected officials, and Republican fundraisers are coming on board. I have something very quick to say. It starts with the words "party platforms," which is the most boring mm. thing in the world you could possibly say on a talk show, and I'm about to prove that. But on the Republican side, you have Donald Trump saying essentially he doesn't care really about his party platform, but his big issues are at odds with longtime Republican mm. orthodoxy, let's say. On the Democratic side, it fascinates me. Bernie Sanders, people, he has picked some people to write the platform who are left-wing activists in a way that I think is unusual, and I think there will be a struggle there, and I wonder if it'll have implications for the Democrats. I think it's part of the story of Philadelphia. Yeah. We're talking about unity in the Republican Party, but then Donald Trump goes out and talks about the governor of New Mexico, Susana Martinez, and, it, and is critical of her. I don't, what do you make yeah. of that? Yeah, I mean, one of the big buzzwords a few weeks ago was pivot. When will Donald yeah. Trump pivot? I think he's showing over and over again that he's either incapable or, or, or has no desire to do that. But I also think that a more important pivot maybe in this moment is Bernie Sanders' willingness to actually pivot into good soldierhood at a certain point and actually bring a lot of the energy he's brought to this race you know, as actually a surrogate against Donald Trump, the way that Elizabeth Warren has, and frankly, as a supporter of Hillary Clinton. You know, you know Mark's point about uh, Donald Trump and the pivot, I mean, Donald Trump has broken so many boundaries right. and kind of shattered, but even by Donald Trump's standards, what he did this week in San Diego, when he went off on an extended rant against the federal judge hearing a case against Trump University, Indiana-born federal judge Gonzalo Curiel, who he described as a Mexican, okay, I mean, that is, that is a striking use of language. I think it is comparable to what he did uh, when he did not denounce David Duke the Sunday before Super Tuesday on, um, on CNN. I mean, it is, I mean, this is an, I mean, we're well beyond it, it, dog whistling. Yeah, we're we're well not, beyond dog whistling. And I think that, whistle. I mean, I think there is a, it is a very legitimate question to Donald Trump. Why is the ethnicity of this judge who was born in Indiana, graduated of Indiana University, why is that relevant? And why is a presidential candidate attacking by name you know a judge hearing you know a case against him? You know why it's relevant to, to Donald Trump? Because when he did that, people <clears throat> cheered. That's why it, it's relevant. It, it works. And here, here's Donald Trump's version of a pivot. Donald Trump's version of a pivot is if you say something or do something, in the case of this judge, that displeases him, right. he will pivot and turn on you because he is, as he's told us, the counterpuncher. So it doesn't matter if it's somebody on your team, like the governor of New Mexico, who you might want, or somebody who's your opponent, like Hillary Clinton, or, or, Elizabeth, or Elizabeth Warren, who we attacked mm. this week as a big mouth Pocahontas, Pocahontas. not helpful. Big mouth. Women don't like that. We, uh, Peggy, if I'm a Republican running a race <laughs> and I see this, it's it's unprecedented and, and, and quite unpredictable for Donald Trump to have gone after Susan, Susanna Martinez. I mean, in other words, in a unity moment to pick a popular rising star in the party and yes. go after them. Isn't and that the crowd the, in her home state loved it, which yes. was also... A but that's startling his. thing. Well, they, 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 just, they, they, like they, just like she's Paul Ryan. She's a politician and he's right, not. Right. I mean, it's and, a basic isn't that a level of unpredictability that's going to be, um, that's what makes 
other Republican lawmakers nervous, that there's always might be one of yeah, those exciting that's the moments. question for those running for the House and for the Senate, that every day they'll have to be parsing their way through, oh my God, how do I respond to this? They'll all um, have to be uh, figuring a out a way to deal with it. Donald Trump ought to do those men and women a favor and stop this, but it's not sure that he can. We talked about people around Hillary can't tell, tell her mm. the truth. Yeah. Who around Donald Trump says to him, right. boss, Stop this. Don't do that but, anymore. But, but, it's but, not but it's, nice. it's more than it's random comments. I mean, Donald Trump could have been defined to the public in a number of different ways. He could have been defined as the business guy bringing his private sector expertise to do kind of a rehab on the economy and government. He could have been provide, defined as the outsider coming to clean up a corrupt political system. And those are both parts of his identity. But the third part, the core, I think, of how he got to the nomination was this identity really, th this identity is kind of the embodiment of kind of racial backlash and kind of anxiety over changing demography. And he keeps going back into to those waters this week with Susanna Martinez and with the judge, right. and, that, and that kind of underscores the real problem. It's not holding together the Republican coalition. It's that the Democratic coalition, which is essentially diverse America and the portions of white America most comfortable with that, will turn out in big numbers. And even if the Republican coalition does turn out, he probably can't overcome that. Last word to you, yeah, Jeff. Peggy, he's not going to stop insulting Mexicans and Native Americans as he did this week because it's working. And he, he goes with what works. I think that's a simple... Well, it's, I, simple I, yeah, I don't think it's working. I, 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 it's working it, for... It's working, it encourages his... Base. It, it brings also, out his base and makes well, him. But part of the reason it does work with his base, uh, I think, is that they kind of hate politicians. They mm. hate the political class. They're not wild about right. us. And when he makes fun of the official elites of America, in no matter what way, they kind of like it because they and don't like Mexican us. Mexican Americans are not the elites of America. Under, no, no, but a big person like Martinez. Uh, do you know what I mean? The judge? That's, I don't know. We'll have to leave it there. Thanks to all of you for that lively discussion. We'll be right back with Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper.